The following program is the work of the broadcast students of the British Columbia Institute of Technology. BCIT magazine features news stories from around the Lower Mainland, which were produced over the last week. Responsibility for the content of the show rests completely with the students and their instructors. Today on BCIT Magazine, residents in Maple Ridge protest the drug use at a homeless shelter in their neighborhood. Two BCIT students take the trip of a lifetime to help those in need in rural India. And a woman's self-defense class comes to BCIT. Hello and welcome to BCIT Magazine, I'm Alexia Molina. And I'm Tim Brooke. After multiple attacks in Paris last week, including assaults on a stadium, a rock concert and restaurants, President Francois Hollande has announced that the country will remain in a state of emergency for three months. The investigation continues after the attacks that killed 129 people and impacted many more worldwide. Our reporter Conley Mostert has been following this story closely. Conley, what are the latest developments? Well, Tim, the tragedies in Paris continue. Two people were killed Wednesday when police searched for Abdelhamid Aboud. He's the alleged mastermind behind the original Paris attacks that resulted in the deaths of 129 people. Now, there was some confusion online. Some people thought that he may have been killed in Wednesday's police raids. We can confirm now that, yes, he indeed was killed in those raids. Conley, what happens next? Well, obviously, in correlation to this story is the massive Syrian refugee uh, talk. There is approximately 25,000 Syrian refugees headed to Canada within the next six weeks, 2,500 of which will be allocated here in the Lower Mainland, with Coquitlam and Surrey hosting the most per capita in British Columbia. But I think a significant talking point surrounding this issue is the recent polling. More than half of Canadians are actually against accepting these refugees. I'll send it back to you guys. Thanks, Conley. Joining us now is Salim Spindari, who is the Manager of Community Outreach and Advocacy Programs at Mosaic BC. Mosaic is a nonprofit that deals with issues regarding immigrants and refugees. Salim, how is Mosaic preparing for such a large amount of refugees in such a short period of time? Yeah, um, normally people think that it's a large number of um, the, um, people coming to the country, but uh, every year Canada welcomes 250,000 newcomers into the country, and among those would be 25,000. Uh, um, traditionally, BC gets 10% of that population, and they would distribute it um, among the cities um, in the province. So many of them will end up going to Prince George, Victoria, Nanaimo, and Metro Vancouver. So for a city like Burnaby, uh, we, would, we might get 200 to 300 refugees, and I don't think it would be a big number. Mosaic has been preparing um, um, uh, our staff. We have um, uh, volunteers. We have uh, settlement uh, uh, services ready to welcome them and to support them as soon as they arrive. Can you talk about the screening process for refugees coming into the country? It seems like a lot of Canadians are a little concerned about it. Uh, that's totally true. Uh, the Canadian um, uh, process uh, for uh, screening refugees is a really rigorous one. Um, they have to go through um, uh, various steps. Um, first, refugee would flee the country. They would go to a, um, a third country. Um, there they would go through screening uh, by the security of that country. Uh, and after that, um, uh, they would be um, uh, screened by uh, UNHCR, uh, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, the, when the file is transferred to the Canadian government, um, the, they would be interviewed by an immigration officer. Then um, uh, there will be uh, th they, they would be checked for three things um, uh, for their admissibility into Canada, um, health, criminality and security. Health is done through doctors, um, criminality and security is done through um, uh, Canada's uh, security agencies, um, RCMP, Canada Border Services Agency and CSIS. Um, uh, so for me it's a really rigorous process and it takes a while, it doesn't take them easy for them to come here. All right. Uh, thank you for all your time. Have a thank great you. afternoon. Thank you very much, Tim. Moving on, a protest that took place outside of Rain City Housing Homeless Shelter in Maple Ridge this week. Conley Mostard has more. 
protesters gathered in front of Rain City Housing in Maple Ridge to voice their concerns about the drug policy inside the temporary shelter. Homeless people in the area were moved to this facility about a month ago. Prior to the move, this tent city behind a Salvation Army is where they called home. The camp's location close to a residential neighborhood led to community outrage and eventually pushed to relocate the residents to a temporary shelter nearby. Some members of the community still aren't happy. Grover Telford, who once ran for city council, organized this latest protest on a Facebook page called Protecting Maple Ridge, which has over 3,000 members. His primary concern is the use of drugs inside the temporary facility, and he's worried the same approach might be used at a permanent shelter as well. There's open drug use, there's no control. Now, if you've ever been to an AA meeting, do you ever see an open bar, an open bar at an AA meeting? Their system works, the 12-step program, because it's all about abstinence. Rain City Housing Maple Ridge shares a different perspective, declaring the shelter is informed by a harm reduction philosophy. Abstinence is not a requirement for staying at the shelter. They went on to add, Rain City is committed to a high level of responsiveness to community concerns. We will promptly respond to concerns and take actions to address them. But not everyone was protesting the shelter. One man was protesting the protesters, arguing they should have taken their concerns to the city. If I want change, I go to City Hall. Um, to bother these people here, it just doesn't make sense. They're not in control, they're not in charge of what the city decides to do, or who they make contracts with, or how long they last. They're here to serve the people, and they, and they do that quite well. The temporary shelter is scheduled to close on March 31st next year, leaving the city of Maple Ridge with a difficult decision regarding future shelter plans. Conley Mostert in Maple Ridge for BCIT Magazine. Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, a Tawasin family is coming together to save their son and BCIT holds its first annual stem cell donation clinic. I chose BCIT because I know that all the programs are very hands-on. We have our own radio station, like it's, it's one of the best programs that I've ever heard of. I am starting a job on Monday, so confidence is high. Uh, honestly, I didn't think it was going to be this fun. A defining moment for me was when I finished my first internship and got lots of really great feedback from industry professionals. I would have never imagined I'd be walking into the floors of TSN and thinking, I'm not a student anymore, I'm here to work. I will be starting a job with an investigative news program in Toronto and I'm really excited to see that grow into what will become hopefully my dream job. BCIT broadcast and online journalism, putting you to work. Welcome back. A couple of BCIT students are heading overseas to put some of their knowledge to good use. Two prosthetic and orthotics classmates will be traveling to India in December with equipment that could drastically improve quality of life for patients. My co-anchor Tim Brook has more. Increment. Forward just a bit there. Students from one of BCIT's smallest programs are taking their prosthetic building skills to rural India where they hope to provide support to over one million in need. Is there is hydraulic fluid and it's being forced through a little chamber. Shane Bates is one of two students who will board a plane to the village of Kopal next month working with a non-profit to provide orthopedics, prosthetics and braces to locals with disabilities or injuries. So there's a physio here in Vancouver who is part of the SODA Foundation, which is, stands for Samua Overseas Development Association. So they already have some physios that have gone over there and worked with the community there, and it's a good opportunity for um, prosthetics and orthotics. The second year classmates will have a great chance to put their skills developed at BCIT to the test, but an instructor that will be joining the trip says the work doesn't end there. Our goal is to provide a, um, a training manual to help them help themselves. So we're not really, we don't want to sort of parachute in, provide these sort of 
um, Western services and then leave. The whole idea is about sustainability. During the six-week trip, the students and their teacher expect to see up to 10 patients each day, some of whom have traveled 15 hours for treatment they can't otherwise afford. Uh, just to put things in perspective, like uh, an average Indian family in these rural areas will make 1,000 rupees a month, which correlates to about $20 Canadian. The students have set up multiple fundraisers to pay for extra equipment they'll need in Kopal. More information is available on their program's websites. Tim Brook in Burnaby for BCIT magazine. One brace and the other one. The free self-defense seminar empowering women is coming to BCIT. Shaquille Majuri spoke to one woman whose life has been changed by the program. Liz Marines is a pink belt in Women Empowered, a self-defense program designed for women. She trains here at North Vancouver Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Women Empowered strives to not only help women defend themselves, but to recognize threats early and build confidence. Quite a long time ago I had a dream where I was getting attacked. And I had some martial arts experience, but I, in the dream I didn't know what to do. Since then, Liz has been training for over a year. She says the most beneficial part of the program has been the confidence she's gained. For me, it's just having an answer to any of the attacks that I think would happen. Her husband, Mark, is the head instructor at North Vancouver Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He says he can see the difference in Liz since she started training. The dream that she had, where she didn't know what to do when she was attacked in the dream, that really led her down this path of, I need to find a better answer. And I feel that she has grown greatly. Mark and Liz are heading to BCIT on November 25th to run a free women-empowered seminar. Other women training at the school say there's no reason to miss out. It's a very empowering feeling to be able to feel like you're, you can take care of yourself just a little bit more than you did yesterday. I came to the open house and I, I started the following week and I've been coming since. So it's, I, I would say just let your guard down. It is a serious um, subject, but we're just there to have fun, teach some moves and just, you know, come away learning some techniques. Liz, who now helps teach the Women's Empowered Program, is excited to work with students on campus. Shaquille Majuri in North Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. The 2015 Canadian Space Summit starts this week with talks detailing Canada's role in space exploration. To kick this off, the H.R. McMillan Space Centre is holding a free public event. At the planetarium, space lovers enjoyed art and history of Canada's critical contributions to space exploration. The, the easiest example would be to uh, look on the back of your $5 bill and you'll see one of uh, our most uh, famous contributions, which of course is the Canada Arm, Canada Arm 1 and 2 that are on the International Space Station. Canadian scientist William Leitch was the first person to propose using rockets in flight, and Canada's next goal is to help humans land on an asteroid. Unger hopes that Mars will follow shortly after. And the Great Hall at BCIT's Burnaby campus played host to a potential life-saving Canadian Blood Services event this week. Kurt Morgan has more on one match. These people are taking a simple test to see if they are a bone marrow match. Only about 25% of people in need can find a match through friends and family, leaving the remaining three quarters hoping for a donor. So one match, we are primarily targeting individuals between the ages of 17 to 35 to donate stem cells or bone marrow. Um, so with that, often individuals who have cancer or who have some form of anemia will require a stem cell or a bone marrow transplant. We actually have I believe there's 22 million people that are registered on this worldwide database. Event organizers had initially hoped to register 25 donors over four hours, but instead they more than double showed up. The donation process can be a painful one. That didn't stop these students. I'm not nervous at all. I mean, you know, it's a little bit of pain for someone's life, so it's a good it's a good outcome. Basically individuals who are going on this um, bone marrow, the stem cell route, they're at their last resort. So this is the last thing that they can possibly do to save their life. If you want to be somebody's one in a million and save a life, it's this easy. Kerr Morgan in Burnaby for BCIT magazine. 
there are hundreds of British Columbians on the kidney transplant list. Patients may wait months or even years, and some may even die before receiving a kidney. But luckily for one family, this will not be the case. Reagan Hasegawa explains. Mon <laughs> family is grateful to be together this upcoming holiday season. They have a lot to celebrate. Their first Christmas as Canadians and the news of a new kidney for their son, Michael. The Mons immigrated from Zimbabwe in 2005, shortly after they discovered Michael's medical issues. He has also um, two more serious conditions. One is a, is a fat malabsorption, um, yeah. which is a, it's a liver condition. And I guess Michael was scheduled to receive a... gallstones. Surgery was postponed. Because Michael's immune system would have been taken right down for the kidney transplant, we had to basically sterilize our house. So I did have to give away my cat. You know, he's my brother, I'll do anything. In desperation, they turned to social media. Yeah, I started this Facebook page and just to kind of see if anyone in the world does have anything like this. The first kidney transplant took place in British Columbia in 1968. Since that time, more than 6,200 transplants have been performed in our province. There are currently 205 people awaiting a kidney transplant. However, with only 21% of the population registered as organ donors, there aren't enough kidneys to keep up with demand. A huge percent of people think they're registered because 17 years ago there used to be a sticker on a driver's license. None of those people are registered unless they got on board with the... To be brave. The face Michael, he will finally get his new kidney in early January, which the Mons say will be the best holiday gift of them all. Reagan Hasegawa in Tawasin for BCIT. Up next on BCIT Magazine, a major beer company gets bottled up. And local curlers find ways to stay safe on the ice. The most rewarding thing for me has been the relationships I developed in the program, both with instructors and classmates. My sense of confidence has never, never been higher. I mean, this, this program has offered great opportunities to be in real world, real industry situations, and, and being in those moments and knowing I can contribute, I can do this. It's exciting to be in this industry and to meet lots of great people and to make amazing friends. BCIT broadcast and online journalism, realizing your potential. Standby graphics, ready camera one. If you want to experience the fast-paced world of news, today on BCIT magazine, striking. Make magic on a movie set, frame, and action. Or bring your creative ideas to life. BCIT's hands-on training will get you started. BCIT Television and Video Production. Your possibilities start here. Do you like coffee? Do you like money? Then you should come down to the Career Cafe Chats, where you'll be able to speak with industry professionals and career specialists. Now every program has a different date that they're hosting this event, so be sure to check with your instructors. Are you looking for a career in the trades? If so, come out to the information session on December 2nd at BCIT from 6 to 8 p.m. You'll learn about a number of trades, including CNC machinists and power engineering. Are you looking to learn how to play racquetball? If so, come out to BCIT Rec Services Learn to Play Racquetball event every Wednesday night. You can sign up at the BCIT Rec Services front desk. Vancouver's Molson Brewery has crafted and shipped millions of litres of beer for almost 60 years. The operation at the iconic building on Burrard Street is now moving to an unknown location, but, as Kyle Balzer reports, the move could stimulate interest for local brewers. Main Street Brewery has been in business for almost two years, crafting and distributing beer for people in the Lower Mainland with local interests. There's some amazing breweries happening in BC right now, you know, you can, you know, some of our friends are making phenomenal world-class beer. Pike's company even has other local craft breweries working together to build up the community. We've seen pretty sizable growth since we've opened. Huge community feel around the craft industry anyway, so having great neighbours like Brassneck, 33 Acres, and now, you know, the rest of them all popping up to the Steel Toe, the Red Trucks, 
so it makes it a really dynamic area of Mount Pleasant. Beer giant Molson is selling their building on the foot of the Burrard Street Bridge. Pike thinks that the move comes from the local market boom in addition to its aging walls. The Molson facility has been around for so long now that uh, I can imagine that a lot of the technology in there isn't at its peak. We reached out to Molson and they were unavailable for comment due to confidentiality reasons, but sent a statement that a purchaser has been found for the 60-year-old building and a transaction could be seen as early as the first quarter of 2016. So what are consumers choosing to drink? Tending to drink more and more local craft beer, but uh, in terms of buying standpoint, uh, out of a, like a pub or an establishment, for myself out of a liquor store would be uh, Budweiser. I think it just kind of factors down to like the taste. I don't really like a heavy, darker beer. Like I know some people prefer like a Guinness or like almost a beer that looks completely black. Like I like something that's more light. Even with Molson's move, Pike believes that people will not lose their natural taste. Eventually, there is going to be times when those people change over to cra the craft sector as opposed to drinking what they drank for most of their lives. I don't think we should judge people on what, what they drink. Kyle Balzer in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Curling enthusiasts across the country breathed a sigh of relief when they heard Olympic curler Brad Gushu was recovering from a nasty fall at the Master Grand Slam of Curling last month. The incident not only worried fans, but added fuel to the debate about whether curlers should wear mandatory headgear. Our reporter Sergio Vargas went to a local rink to see what some clubs are doing to combat injuries. Keeping their feet on the ground is a stronger focus for curlers these days, even experienced ones like Ruth. He hasn't thought about wearing headgear before, but thinks it's a good idea for certain curlers. I think it's good, especially for the school kids that don't curl all the time and come out and they're not aware that they can have such terrible falls and I think that, uh, that headgear would be good for them. He hit his head and he actually did pass away. That's Leslie Ruby, who manages a new Westminster club. She was talking about an accident that happened earlier this year in northern BC. Leslie says new headgear specific for the sport is becoming more popular because of such incidents, but stresses the main way to prevent injury is to train curlers to be more aware. That's where accidents happen. People running down the ice, people tripping over our backboards or the boards or, or rocks and not paying attention. Um, generally curlers are quite aware of their surroundings. Now there aren't many recorded injuries in curling, but a study released by the Public Health Agency of Canada said that 90% of injuries that did occur happened from a fall, 30% of which involved a head impact. The study concluded that the best way to prevent injury was from wearing proper footwear. Although Curling Canada suggests certain footwear for different situations, they're happy to see headgear becoming more popular. And not stepping onto the ice with a slider. Uh, you always only use your slider if you're delivering a lock. Otherwise, you have grippers on the hard to see a downside for a curler who is not confident stepping onto a sheet of curling ice to not wear some form of head protection. As for Ruth, she has decades of experience on the ice, but other curlers may be changing the way they look at safety in the sport. Sergio Vargas in U.S. Mincer for BCIT Magazine. And reporter Sergio Vargas joins us now. Sergio, what has Curling Canada said about regulating headgear in the sport? Well, Alexia, when I talked to Curling Canada, they mentioned that they were in the middle of making concussion protocol, which was actually requested by uh, Sports Canada. They requested this for all national sports organizations. Uh, they, in this protocol, they did mention that there will be some guidelines towards safety gear, including headgear, but unfortunately that won't be ready until the next general meeting, which isn't set until next summer. And when that protocol does come in, how quickly will they be able to implement these guidelines? Actually, rinks are able to make their own guidelines whenever they want, really. Uh, the thing with curling is that across the country, most clubs are run in privately run facilities, which means all Curling Canada can really do is suggest guidelines. They can't mandate anyone to follow their rules. This is why we've seen in some clubs already take up some safety gear guidelines and others not quite yet. So right now, it's pretty much just a waiting game to see when all the clubs make their own guidelines. Back to you guys. With winter fast approaching, Vancouver can expect a lot of rain. My co-anchor Alexia Molina spoke to a group who is creating what they call an indestructible umbrella to deal with it. While Vancouver can be known for its oceanfront and mountainous views, it's more famous for this. However, a company in Vancouver says they've developed a better way for Vancouverites to deal with the wet conditions. 
The goal is to create the last umbrella that you'll, you'll ever buy. Kevin Truong and Kehei Ho are the mechanical engineers behind Hedgehog Products Incorporated, and they've created the Cypress. Once we came to Vancouver, we had to use a lot of umbrellas. Eventually, we weren't happy with a lot of the umbrellas we used. The idea of using an aluminum handle. The Cypress has a fully telescopic architecture. Another feature was also to have a, a fully closed enclosure as well as an independent suspension system. Like, uh, we took the suspension what you normally find in a car. Enabling it to withstand 10 times the wind that most regular umbrellas can. But quality doesn't come cheap. With 30% off during their Kickstarter campaign, the Cypress currently goes for $70. I buy an umbrella for $8 from Superstore. It'll last me for a season. Sometimes it doesn't. If I lose it, I can replace it. No big deal. But. That is a ridiculous amount of money for a piece of plastic and metal. I would, yeah. I would, because I have so many umbrellas that have just all popped out and they're totally wrecked forever, so, yeah. The Cypress is expected to be delivered to Kickstarter backers starting May 2016. Alexia Molina in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Speaking of the weather we've had lately, 29,000 BC Hydro customers lost power early Wednesday morning due to a windstorm. A number of schools were closed and a few BC ferry sailings were delayed. There are still over 3,000 people around the Lower Mainland without power. The seawall at Stanley Park will be shut down for several weeks after a powerful storm damaged the wall. A portion of the wall collapsed due to heavy winds and powerful waves. And local ski mountains are opening early for the winter season. Both, both Whistler and Cypress have announced their slopes will be available to the public starting this week. And well, if the power doesn't come back tomorrow, it looks like a lot of cell phone data will be used to stream the Canucks game tonight. The Canucks will be facing off against the Chicago Blackhawks here at Rogers Arena. If you have any questions or comments regarding this program, please visit us online at bcit-broadcast.com or bcitbroadcastnews.ca. I'm Alexia Molina. And I'm Tim Brook. That's today's BCIT Magazine. Thanks for watching. We leave you now with scenes from the North Vancouver Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Studios.